Um, I live on a little farm, little homestead in Idaho. I'm originally though from Minnesota and I was uh, raised in the Lutheran church. I got saved in the early 70s, uh, 1971, baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, was involved in that, um, that huge, gigantic revival that, you know, sort of swept through the United States, you know, back in the Jesus movement and all of that. And um, being raised a Lutheran, I, I didn't know anything about getting saved because they don't talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And I had a girlfriend who was a Southern Baptist and she invited me to her um, youth um, gathering that they were having, their, their big central youth gathering in Minneapolis. And, uh, and I remember being there in this big crowd of, of kids and this guy started talking about having a personal relationship with Jesus which was something I had never heard of before. I mean, I'd been in church all my life since I was six days old and I never heard that you could have a relationship with the God of the universe. And so when he gave the invitation, would anybody like to receive Christ? <laughs> would anybody like to know God? That was the very first time I heard Jesus speak to me. And he spoke in my heart and he said, would you like that? Would you like that, Brenda? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I, 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 this is something I've wanted. You know, I'm 15, but I've kind of wanted it in my deep depths of my heart ever since you know I was little. I'd always had this hunger for God, and I, I raised my hand and I was, uh, you know, prayed the prayer and I was born again. And immediately there was this new life that came about inside of me. So I. Shortly after that, I was sitting on my bed at home and I had my Bible opened up in front of me. And this was the second time I heard the Lord speak to me. And he said, Brenda, what do you want? What would you like? And um, in my mind at the time, I knew the story of Solomon when God asked Solomon, what can I give you? What would you like? Mm. And Solomon asked for wisdom. And I, I looked at the Bible on my lap and I said, Lord, I would like to know what this is that when i open up a page i'll know what's on it that i can read it and understand it and i believe god answered that prayer <laughs> of a 15 year old girl and uh my my first husband was a pastor we were in pastoral ministry for 20 years and um then uh, we were divorced uh for reasons personal <laughs> Sure. And uh, then uh, kind of a wilderness journey. I met my second husband that we've been married uh, for almost 22 years now. And uh, we have a ministry together on um, a Discord channel where we actually talk about simple Christianity, organic churches. We've, we're out of the institutional church and we're exploring other ways of gathering. So anyway, about... Um, 2015, the Lord really started getting my attention that we were in the end times, even though I'd been watching for the Lord's coming since 1971, okay, for a long time. And um, I'd studied just about every version of eschatology that's out there, you know, the pre-trib, pre-wrath, um, uh, mid-trib, uh, post-wrath. And, you know, I've always been a pre-millennial person, I believe in a literal millennium that Jesus will return before the millennium begins. But, you know, I, I explored eschatology. And then in 2015, all of a sudden I became aware that we were probably in the end times. And I became aware of the Revelation 12 sign and the blood moons and all of that. And uh, again, this led to a prayer that I had where I said, I mean, I, I'm like uh, out picking raspberries and I, I'm realizing we're in the end times and I'm, I'm weeping and I'm saying to the Lord, you know, don't pass me by, don't pass me by, don't, don't let this end time stuff, you know, come and I'm totally unaware and I don't know what's going on. And so from basically that time forward, um, the Lord has been really guiding me in um, not following a you know systematic theology of a prescribed predictable end time eschatology but really guiding me in the word of god to 
helped me to understand and a lot of missteps along the way, but, um, uh, and I, I wrote and uh, it needs to be revised. <laughs> so much has changed, but um, this has sort of been uh, what I eat, drink, sleep, think about all the time. So what I wanted to do, well, before I do that, do you guys want to say anything? <laughs> What an amazing story. You know, it's it's interesting because I have a very similar um, genesis myself. When I was 14 years old, um, I was on the grounds of the church that I was originally raised with at a fountain called the Fountain of Living Waters. Um, I'll have to find a picture and share it because it's a beautiful fountain. And uh, I had just heard the, the similar teaching about Solomon. And I was, wa I was uh, walking in the garden and uh, I had asked the same thing, but I asked for wisdom without the money because <laughs> I never <laughs> wanted to be tempted with the love, with the love of money. I just wanted to be able to understand the scripture and understand um, what was hidden. And I feel like that he answered that prayer uh, because I have such a, a voracious appetite for, for knowing things. And it, it freaks people out sometimes because um, I have an engineer's mind, which mm -hmm. we, we do a lot of stuff by trial and error. You know, uh, you know, just try things to see what works and what doesn't work. And I do that with the scripture and it helps eliminate all the chaff so that like what's what's real remains. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for sharing that. That was a real blessing. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I, you know, there it is. Um, you know, talk about engineering mind. I don't have that. My husband's an engineer and I actually have an artist's mind. I, I'm a more artistic kind of person, very right brained. And mm -hmm. um, so it makes for a um, interesting way of viewing life. And actually, it really helped a lot when it comes to the book of Revelation, because oh, that's yeah. me. I, it's written in the Hebraic style, which is very right brained, very yeah. Um, yeah. creative. Yeah, a, and, yeah. So yeah, I'm a photographer and musician by trade. Um, okay. Where Watchful is uh, an engineer, programmer, coder. Like you couldn't put two opposite personalities <laughs> more in the same. But you know, we both have a passion and love for the gospel and Christ, so it's a great fit. But I mean, the it, the personalities don't. You couldn't be more polar opposite, which is great. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, I'm glad you guys got together. I'm glad you have this this channel going. And, you know, I just pray God's, you know, richest blessing on you and that he guides and leads you and his spirit is with you. That's um, that's all we really want. Yeah. So um, what I thought I would do today is <laughs> try something new. And uh, I, I haven't done this uh, on a live stream and I haven't done this even on my channel. And that is um, I put together a PowerPoint presentation and this is going to help keep me focused so I stay on on task <laughs> and not uh, deviate and veer off into strange places and and I know that the topic for tonight is the the three raptures and um, and when I first came across the idea of three raptures well actually I, I've always thought there was one and then when I discovered that there were two in the book of Revelation, I just about panicked, you know, because <laughs> how, how could there be two? Nobody believes that. And then when I saw three, I was like, oh, man, I'm a crazy person. And <laughs> so but there they are. So um, what I thought I would do today is actually lay out the big picture foundation so that when I actually go in to talk about the three raptures, they're in a context. Okay, because the context that I'm coming from isn't normal. It isn't the one most people um, are thinking about. And actually, I'm the way I'm putting this together tonight is not even something that the people on my channel have heard before. So this will be new for them too. So anyway, so you can go ahead and throw throw up the first um, first slide there, and we'll just <laughs> we'll just muddle on through as best we can here. <laughs> This will be fun. Okay, so eschatology. Yeah, this is basically how mainstream eschatology has lost the plot. Right, there's a reason for the end times. And the reason for the end times is 
has to do with what's happened in the beginning of time, that this is the solution to what's the problems that were taking place in the beginning, the very beginning. And as eschatology um, has developed over the years, uh, this prefabricated systematic um, tradition passed on through churches and denominations and all of that. What I realized last year, it, it was last year that I first realized this, that we lost the plot. We forgot, mm -hmm. or we didn't even know what this is all about. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a, a something that a lot of people talk about, that the way we understand, um, understanding the beginning actually helps us understand God's purpose for the end times. And the scripture for that is Isaiah 46, 10. I declare the end from the beginning and ancient times from what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and all my good pleasure I will accomplish. In other words, the things that God has declared that he wants to have accomplished, things that he declared from the very beginning of time are things that he is going to bring to fruition at the end. His good pleasure will be accomplished. So you can go to the next one. Okay. All right. So this gets to... Why are we here? <laughs> Why did God create man? This is like one of the biggest questions that we have to answer. And this is uh, because this is something that, well, we'll just, I, I'm about to get off on a tangent. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick to my, <laughs> stick to my notes here. So man right was created to have dominion over the earth. That's why we're here. Okay, now a lot of people say we're here to worship God, we're here to, you know, all kinds of other things. But the original purpose was that we would have dominion. God created an earth, the earth and then he created man to have dominion. So Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is the reason why God created mankind. It's to have dominion over the earth. All right, so you can go to the next one. Okay, so now we all are familiar with the fall of man, okay? Um, and here's, here's a point that I want to make that I think is super important. And that is, is that God decreed that men are going to have dominion. Only men can rule the earth. Angels can't rule the earth. Um, you know, other creatures, it's man. Okay. The descendants of Adam are supposed to rule the earth. This is how the divine decree goes. Now, Satan couldn't rule the earth directly. He couldn't have dominion over the earth directly. He had to find a man through whom he could work. And so he went through the woman to get to Adam. And then, you know, Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now what happened was not that Satan took over dominion of the earth, but he took God's position as the one who was going to be calling the shots over men. Okay. That's awesome. And what <laughs> no, no, just your, the, your, you present, your, no, your presentation is just awesome. So I was just commenting. Oh, oh, good. Thank you. So once Adam fell, well, then mankind's allegiance was like transferred from God to Satan and Satan became the prince of the world. Now, the reason why there has to be a, a man antichrist, okay, and the antichrist has the number of a man, it's a real man, is because only men can rule the earth. All right, so you can go to the next one. All right, so, um, and for this uh, information on this slide, I want to give some credit to Dr. Michael Heiser. I don't know how familiar you are with him. Oh, and sure. his, um, yeah, I thought he had a lot of really good things that he did. And um, uh, what is the Unseen Realm was a documentary. And I, I think he made lots of good points in that. But one of them is, uh, I heard him say in a lecture that uh, if you were to ask a Jewish person why there's so much evil in the world, they would say, well, number one, the fall of man. 
and then they would say it was uh, these fallen entities, okay? That it, it wasn't just that man fell and that there was Satan, you know, using men, uh, but there also were um, these fallen sons of God. So during the days of Noah in uh, Genesis chapter six, we read about how um, the sons of God came into the daughters of men and had children with them. And these are the mighty men of old, the giants, okay? And what happened during the days of Noah was that man's dominion was actually in the process of being totally usurped through the Nephilim, through the hybrids, through the, those fallen offspring of the sons of God who mated with the daughters of men. And by the time you get to, to Noah, it says he, he was perfect in his generation. It was like he and his family, eight people, were the only ones left. That the dominion was going to be taken by these um, hybrid offspring. So the solution to that was get rid of these guys. And so through the, uh, um, the flood came and destroyed all these hybrids, okay, these Nephilim who lived at that time. But Genesis 6 tells us that there were other similar incursions after the flood. And we know that because there was Goliath, there were giants in the land when the spies went out and spied out Jericho and the Anakim and the Rephaim and all of these tribes were um, part of the Nephilim. So this. Yeah, there's, this there's a lot of evidence. We've actually covered that on quite a few shows. Uh, we're working on having L.A. Marzulli on the show. Do you know who he is? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah, I don't know him personally. Him. But, yep. Yeah. Lots of lots of evidence for the Nephilim. Yes. So, and not just before the flood, but also afterward. And here is the other point that I want to make is that hybrids are going to be in existence during the end times. Okay. They're going to be in existence during the end times. Now, my thinking is this, is that if there are going to be hybrid creatures lurking around <laughs> during the end times, they should show up in the book of Revelation, and they actually mm. do. They're referred to as the earth dwellers or those who dwell on earth. And they're to be distinguished from men from people, tribes, tongues, and nations, or men or mankind. The earth dwellers, um, uh, and this next little bit, I actually got from Chuck Missler. I don't know if, how familiar you are with him. Oh yeah, but, I love Chuck. He's gone on to glory, but he, um, in one of his lectures, talked about how when um, the uh, they were the they were writing the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, translated from Hebrew into Greek, when they wanted to translate the word uh, Nephilim into uh, the Greek language, they used the word "earthborn." It's gigantes, but it's the meaning in English is earthborn. Hmm. And I'm I so I'm getting to this place where I'm looking in the Bible and I'm going, wait a minute, the earth dwellers, they're not, I don't think they're real people. And in, in two places in Revelation, it says about them that their names were never written in the book of life. Those who oh, dwell on earth, whose names were never written in the book of life, twice in Revelation 13, 8 and 17, 8. And if we go back to uh, Genesis chapter 3, where it talks about the seed of the serpent and the, the seed of the woman, we're talking about seed wars here. We should expect that the seed war thing that started in Genesis is going to continue all the way through to the end, and we should be able to find it in Revelation. So the... Uh, um, the other point I want to make here before we move on is that Genesis gives us kind of in seed form all the big major themes that we're going to be seeing later on in the book of Revelation. And so when the book of Revelation talks about the book of life, for example, um, there is a principle of first mention. You go to wherever like book is mentioned. When, when is a book mentioned for the very first time? Well, it's mentioned in Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations of mankind that got, when God made them in his image, male and female. And then it lists Adam and it goes on to list people in Genesis 5, real people. 
And then in Genesis 6, you see the incursion of the Nephilim, people who are not real people, whose names were never in the book of life. They're not human. Okay, so, so we got a problem. It's not just a sin problem. It's a dominion problem that's been um, aggravated by the presence of hybrids. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So there are three basic problems here that are going to be solved. These problems are stated in Genesis. They're going to be resolved in Revelation. Well, some of them are resolved before then. Okay, the first problem is, how is God going to resolve man's sin problem? Okay, and I think you guys know the answer to that. The second problem, though, is how is God going to deal with the dominion problem? Because the dominion problem is going to be huge, especially during the end times. And the third problem is, how is God going to regain man's voluntary allegiance once more? Okay, these are the three problems that are going to be solved during the end times. All right, so um, go ahead and you can go to the next one. All right, so of course Jesus is the answer <laughs> at his first. I mean, Jesus died and rose to take care of man's sin problem. He's the Lamb of God who took away the, or takes away the sin of the world. Okay. First coming is the problem of sin was resolved. Jesus is going to come again to judge the fallen ones. And I'm talking about all the fallen ones. So that man can regain the, his total dominion over the earth. Because that's why we were created. We were created for dominion. Hey, Brenda, hold on one second, okay? Yeah. Hold on one second. Oh, you're muted, brother. <laughs> I'm going to address someone in the comments. RJ Shine okay. um, says that we're all worshiping demons and we're not um, in fear of the Lord. I understand that you're new here, but before making condescending comments toward our community and family here, I really encourage you to just watch and listen. I, you'll find that everybody here is simply here to learn and love Christ. So just take a breather and just pay attention. All we are here is to bring people to Christ. So, you know, take it easy. Sorry, Brenda, you can continue. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Okay, so Jesus is the answer. Okay, so he died at his first coming, solved the sin problem. His second coming, he's coming back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's going to solve the dominion problem. And after the millennium, okay, Christ is going to, during the millennium, he is going to take everything and subject it to himself. And then he's going to hand everything to the Father, so that God can be all in all. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15, 28. So it won't be until after the millennium that God's problem of people um, subjecting themselves to him willingly will finally all find a resolution. Okay, so the next slide. Shush, there it is. Man, that took a long yeah, time to switch. Okay, so this was my big aha moment about a year ago. And I was, um, because I've been making a timeline, okay, and putting things in order, taking Revelation apart, you know, verse by verse, word by word. And, you know, in fact, I created a giant blackboard in one of the rooms that I have so I could graph things out, erase them, place them in new places, you know because it's the book is so massive and so detailed but it was last year oh it was like this big aha moment and i go how could i have not seen this how could i have not seen this that what god is going to be doing during the end times he's got a war plan it's a war plan okay and basically he is going to consolidate his enemies all the fallen ones are going to be consolidated in one place during the end times and that is on earth they're all going to be consolidated on the earth and this is so uh such an amazing um i don't want to say god trick 
attacking the enemy. I don't, I don't think that he's doing that, but it's, it's, uh, you know, what Satan, when he overstepped his bounds and he had Jesus, you know, crucified and, you know, got into Judas and all of that, Satan didn't realize that he'd overstepped at his bounds and that actually through death, resurrection life would come. That death is not the end of everything. In fact, sometimes death is how things work out for God. Okay, so God's plan, I think, is going to make the enemy think that they're winning because they're all going to be consolidated here on earth. God is going to make sure that they're all consolidated here and that they have control, absolute control over the earth for, um, you know, for 42 months ish. Okay. So you can go to the next one. So when I talk about God's enemies, who am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the enemies that he has in heaven. There's enemies here on earth and there's enemies under the earth. Now in heaven, there are Satan and the fallen angels. Now I know that the Catholic church and Augustine and all these people back in the day said that Satan was already cast out and a third of the angels fell with him and all that's already happened. And the answer, the only place that they get that is Revelation 12 and Revelation is a book of future prophecy. So no, Satan has not been cast out of heaven. His angels are not cast out of heaven. Satan still accuses the brethren before God day and night. This is the reason why Jesus ever liveth to make intercession for us at the altar in heaven. Okay, that's why Jesus is there right now, according to the book of Hebrews. Now, God also has enemies here on earth, okay? Uh, we know that when the Nephilim perished in the flood, that their bodies died because they were bodies of, of flesh. They had earth suits on, uh, dust, dust bodies, I call them. But there wasn't a place for their spirits to go, so their spirits became the demons. And the demons are always looking for a body. And there were other incursions that happened after the flood. We don't know how many more of these creatures were made that when they die, um, the, there's more demons that are being created. I think, this, I think there are far more demons on earth now than ever existed in times past because I think there are more hybrids who, who died and now their spirits have gone out and looking for bodies. So. What we've got are demons on the earth and we've got demon controlled people and we've got the whole hybrid issue. And there are other people who know more about that. L.A. Marzulli, for example, um, Russ Dizdar, who has also gone on to be with the Lord. There are a lot of people who delve into that far more deeply than I do. I, I just know that they're in existence. And God has enemies too that reside under the earth. There are the fallen angels who are in the pit and this, these are the worst of the worst angels that are being kept in chains in darkness because they were the ones who didn't want to keep their proper estate, but, you know, took on human bodies and, you know, mated with human women. So they are actually in the pit right now. Okay, so next slide. All right. So this was a gigantic wake up call. I know for me. For a lot of oh, people, yeah. a lot of people um, thought that there was going to be a rapture then in 2017. Uh, this is the great sign of uh, the woman of September 23rd, 2017. And I'm, uh, you can see the starry alignment there, um, you know, with Virgo and the sun and the moon and Jupiter and the, the crown of 12 stars, that this was an astronomical alignment. And according to some people, it was a once in 7,000 year alignment. And I know there've been similar ones, but there haven't been nothing exact that I am aware of. This is the, the, the most perfect alignment that's happened. Maybe you know more about that than I do watchful, but. I, I've actually checked 14,000 years. It doesn't, it never happens again. Okay. If it does, it's okay. in 15,000 years and more. <laughs> Okay, so when I am st was started studying that, you know, really diving into the end time stuff, the sign, this sign was absolutely incredible. And I was like getting ready for it in 2015 
And I was hoping rapture would happen before 2017. I couldn't imagine waiting till right. 2017. And then it came and it went. Okay. And, and it looked like nothing happened. But what happened was the sign. The sign was mm -hmm. the thing. Okay. Right. The sign actually put us in the book of Revelation. Exactly right. You, you can put a date there, September 23rd, 2017. We are now in the book. Okay. We're in the book. Now notice I didn't say we are in the tribulation because I don't think that's a thing actually. And, uh, but we are in the book of revelation. So the, the next thing, oh, and, and, and the other thing that happened when the sign showed up was this was when I went, you know, I think that God is telling the end time story in the book of Revelation. And I'm not sure why everybody focuses on Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and, you know, Matthew or John 14. Why aren't people looking at Revelation? Because it seems to me like the, like everything's like right there in that book. At least God said it was there. And the other thing that happened was I said, you know, if the sign is in Revelation 12, I think we should start with Revelation 12. So I kind of started there in my studies of Revelation. And um, what I discovered was that Revelation 12 actually gives us the full framework. It's the framework on which hangs everything else in Revelation. The mm -hmm. Revelation 12. So when I started my Revelation chapter by chapter series, I didn't start with chapter one. I started with chapter 12 because everything hangs on this chapter. All right. So the next one. All right. So the, the great sign of the woman of Revelation 12 that happened in 2017. And so next in order, we're waiting for the sign of the dragon which is the next sign. Now, there are a couple ways you can look at this. And I, I know that there the story is also told in the stars. Okay, there's Draco and there's a bunch of other things going on in the starry heavens. The other thing that I realized when we're, when we're looking at some of the stuff in Revelation is, is the way the Hebraic thought works, which is even though Revelation's written in Greek, it's written with from the mindset of, of a Hebraic prophetic style. So we're talking about layers of meaning. There's going to be multiple layers. And, you know, people have to be comfortable with that. That has to be okay. It's not just one thing sometimes. Sometimes there's going to be multiple layers. So um, the, the important thing to me, though, is actually not just knowing what's going on in the starry heavens or understanding you know, that this sign is going to take place, but in the, the real world events that this sign is depicting. So um, the sign of the dragon is actually the sign that depicts the circumstances that surround the rapture of the male child. And we'll look at that a little more detailed in, in a minute here. And when we're talking about God consolidating all the enemy, all his enemies on earth, this is the first part of the consolidation. Satan is going to take a third of his angels because he can't make God's angels do anything, but he can take a third of his angels and cast them to the earth. So Satan will be on the earth. He's going to stand before the woman. And actually, let's just go to the next slide because that's where the verse is. So this is the sign of the dragon, Revelation 12, 3 to 5. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems, and his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Okay. And Revelation 1, we learn that stars are angels. Okay. Jesus says that the seven stars in his hands are, the, are angels of the seven churches. So one of the things we learn is that stars can be stars in heaven, stars can be angels and um you know stars can fall to the earth so there's multiple meanings for stars okay so he's going to take a third of his angels and cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who is about to give birth so that when she bore her child he might devour it 
and she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And that the Greek word there that's translated as caught up is that word harpazo. So that's 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 the rapture word. All right, so we'll do the next slide. Okay. So this is the real world breakdown here. Uh, I'm decoding this. Okay, I'm going to decode it for you. And, and you know, I just want to say this. These are my thoughts. I'm sharing my thinking. And I, and I know that there's a whole bunch of other ways people can view this stuff. And I don't insist that anybody agree with me on anything. So yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. I mean, it's, it's totally fine. We, we love and we learn together. And it's all just a giant puzzle. Just because your research indicates what you found, that doesn't mean you're right or wrong. You're just sharing your devotion and research with us, and we're totally good with that. Awesome. Yeah, and the way I like the way I like to present it is Second Timothy two fifteen says says study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We don't stand approved before anybody else. We stand approved yes. before God. So everybody. Right. Um, that we have as a guest on our show, they're showing what the work that they've done to stand approved before God. They're not uh, approved of us. So we can, you know, if we're humble and we're meek, we can possibly learn from what they've done to show themselves approved. Likewise, uh, we can learn from each other. That's why love is such a big deal is yeah. we don't all have the big picture. We've got pieces and it helps. No, to we all have pieces, pieces of the puzzle. And, you know, humility is really the only way that you learn anything. And, uh, you know, I never saw in that passage study to show yourself approved. That's, that's really great. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's lovely. Sure. Makes me feel happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So it keeps, this it, it is keeps my, us humble. Uh, be, it keeps us humble because everybody wants to be right. Right. So when 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 you realize that somebody has worked towards something to show themselves approved, they're trying to be right. Um, and then when when you recognize that and you recognize that, well, you can be wrong and you can learn from them, then you get that beautiful harmony in the household. Yes, yes, that's so true. And you know what I'm looking for in people when I when I say, okay, I'll, I'll go on your channel, I'm just looking for people who have hearts that are, you know, full of the fruit of the spirit, because when when people are spirit led, and they have the fruit of the spirit evidenced in their life, that that means that the spirit can flow, and he can work and the spirit is going to guide us into all truth. And so that to me is like one of the most the most necessary parts for well any said. Kind of dialogue. Well said. Amen. People have so. well said. Okay. All right. So um, this is uh, my decode of of the the um, the symbols here, and and Revelation is a symbolic book, and there's going to be multiple decodes for different symbols. And we have to be okay with that. Uh, we know that the dragon is Satan. Later on, we're going to read how it's he's that ancient serpent, uh, the devil, and the um, you know all of that later on in Revelation 12. Stars are angels, and in this case, fallen angels. Uh, the woman is Israel, and the male child represents a firstborn son. And... Um, Travail. <laughs> I was trying to decide, do I want to say something now? I'll say it later. <laughs> okay. Uh, travail is a war or an invasion. Uh, the birth of the male child is not the same thing as the catching away of the male child. The child is going to be born. Satan, the dragon, is going to try to devour the child. And then the child will be caught up or raptured. So these, this is basically how I break down the symbols here. And there's a very, um, there's actually a lot of passages that talk about travail, the travail of, of being equated with war or invasion. And uh, one of them is Jeremiah 432. For I hear a cry like a woman in labor, a cry of anguish like one bearing her first child, the cry of the daughter of Zion gasping for breath, stretching out her hands to say, woe is me for my soul faints before the murderers. This is an invasion coming um, to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem at the time. So 
Um, and there's other other passages that talk about why is every man hands on their loins like a woman in labor. So we're talking about a war that there's going to be a war or an invasion of Israel is part of the circumstances in which the male child will be born. So last year, when that October 7th thing happened, I was like practically beside myself because I'm going, oh, it's starting. Hmm. This is this is starting. But the thing is that is that by the time the woman is in, you know, right now it's just birth pains, you know, it's the pre-labor, well, it's labor, but it's not the, you know, transition and the the really hard stuff that happens later. The hard stuff is going to happen later on and Israel will be all alone. And I think that's the conditions under which the male child will be born and then caught up to God and to his throne. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so first we have the one third of Satan's fallen angels coming to the earth as part of the sign of the dragon. And um, what form they take, I don't know. They may show up like, like aliens or, you know, return of the gods. I don't know. But I know that when the really bad stuff happens in Israel, this is my, my belief, is that when the really bad war or invasion happens in Israel, and I think it's possible it could be the Gog Magog war coming from, from the north there, that in conjunction with that, in the fog of war, there is going to be, um, Satan is going to have a third of his angels coming to the earth at that time. And I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that when we get there, we'll know what it is. Okay, so shortly after that, um, there's going to be the fallen sons of God who've been contained in the pit in deepest darkness, um, un, un, you know, till the end, and they're going to be released from the pit. And this is Revelation 9, 1, 2, and 10. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And I think that's another one of these fallen angels. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit. And from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. And they have tails and stings like scorpions. And their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. And they have as king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. And his name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he's called Apollyon. And my belief is that Apollyon is the seed of the serpent who is going to indwell the man, Antichrist. So we know that the Antichrist is, um, the beast is going to die and resurrect. And Apollyon, I believe, is the one who's going to indwell him. Uh, because Revelation 11 talks about this beast who ascends from the bottomless pit. Now, Revelation 13 talks about the beast from the sea. The beast who ascends from the bottomless pit is Apollyon entering into this resurrected person. Right. And... Yeah, Revelation 11, 7 talks about the two witnesses. And when they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will declare war against them and he will conquer them and kill them. Right. Yeah. So that's the, the second group that are coming. And if you can go to the next slide. All right. So the... The beings who are in the pit, these are the ones that Jude describes in Jude 6. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And I think that phrase is absolutely key to this. The judgment of the great day. The great day is actually another day, another word or phrase for uh, the day of the Lord. And I'm going to talk about that a little more later on here. And then the next slide. Okay. 
So you got a third of the angels being cast out. You got all the angels from the bottomless pit being brought to the earth. And then God is going to clean house in heaven. Michael and his angels are going to fight with the dragon and his angels. And they're all going to be cast out of the out of heaven permanently permanently they will never ever ever go back ever again okay so this is going to be great who knows how long that these angels have had access uh, you know to the throne of god and you know accusing people and all of that it's just blah 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 that god has had to listen to all these who knows how many ages <laughs> and finally they're going to be cast out finally and uh Judgment always begins with the household of God, and I guess God is going to start cleaning his house first and make sure all these bad guys are out of there. So uh, let's read, um, th go to the next slide. And this also through nine. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down. And I just want to make this observation here. This is just sanctified imagination. But we know that. Um, Satan can appear as an angel of light and that I believe that when he is cast out from heaven to the earth, he and his angels are not going to look like, you know, bat guys, you know, all slimy and everything. They are going to put on the glory. Oh, for sure. Deception at they, its finest. Deception at its finest that this is God come to earth. God I, is finally dwelling with men. Agreed. Okay, and all of the entourage, all of the angels are coming. It's a huge deception. Huge. For sure. You kind of have to read between the lines, but I think it's there. <laughs> oh, no, you're absolutely right. I agree. Yeah. All right. So, next slide. Okay, so here are some of the other fallen ones who are going to be on the earth during the end times. And remember, this is a consolidation of all God's enemies in one place. So we also have four angels that are bound at the Euphrates River. They're going to be released. That's at the sixth trumpet, Revelation 9. And those are we the, I believe those are the fallen angels that Enoch refers to back in Genesis, that the, the worst of the fallen angels that first landed on Mount Hermon. Um, I, I forget their names, but that's where they were bound by Michael. Well, I think that these are the worst of the worst of these kind of angels. I think well, that's what I mean. They were they were the horrendous. Those four uh, were bound by Michael in the book of Enoch, and, and it references um, the time period in Genesis. So out of the 200 that came down, the four worst were bound under the Euphrates. That's awesome. Thank you appreciate that. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's awesome. So we have those four really bad guys. And by the way, it's those four really awful angels, really powerful, wicked angels who along with the 200 million, I don't know if they're men or hybrids or what they are, troops, are going to kill a third of mankind. So this is, you know, we're, we're, we're talking big stuff here. Watchful and I were just talking about that last night. Okay. Yep. That's funny that you should say that. We just literally talked about that last night. Well, cool. Yeah. So after them, then we have these earth dwellers or those who do on earth. And I believe these are the hybrids. And I think there's a lot of them personally. I think there's a lot of them. We're also going to have the Antichrist, that is the beast from the sea. And uh, I believe in this case, the sea also represents death. Um, the sea is all, often used as a reference for death. And so when the beast rises from the dead, rises from the sea, uh, he's going to be here as the 
false son. We have Satan here as the false God, the father, and then we have the false prophet as the fake Holy Spirit. And I believe because the false prophet is the beast from the earth, he also will be an earth dweller, a hybrid kind of person. And then we also have the demons and demon possessed people. And we also have people then who will take the mark or worship the beast or its image. And anyone who does that declares their allegiances with the beast and they will um, go into the lake of fire. So once people take the mark, if they do that, they sort of transfer themselves from being like a real person to being one of these fallen ones. So there's going to be this huge consolidation of all God's enemies here on earth. All right, next slide. Now, all of this, all of these fall. <clears throat> of a few months. So all the fallen angels will be on the earth, including Satan. That is the ones who are in heaven. All the watchers, that is the fallen sons of God who were in the pit, are going to be on the earth. And any other fallen spirit or hybrid entity is going to be on the earth. All right. Now, next, next slide. So a great separation is going to take place. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, in the, the next slide after this. But I, what I want people to realize is that before the 42-month reign of the beast begins, which will happen at the time of the abomination of desolation, every fallen entity will be on the earth. All of them. So when we're talking about the days of Noah, we're not just talking about, you know, levels violence or lgbtq or whatever people want to talk about we're talking about the literal days of noah with hmm. our version of the nephilim and the sons of god and all these fallen ones being on the earth and actually probably making up a larger percentage of you know of entities on the earth there'll be more of them than there are of people wow okay so next we're going to get to the raptures okay <laughs> so um all right <laughs> oh yeah you completely so, forgot that's what we were talking about <laughs> yeah so i have to lay this out so you understand the big picture of what's actually going on because What's happened is we've lost the plot. We've forgotten what this is all about. This is about dominion. This is about getting mm -hmm. dominion back. This is about God, um, people voluntarily choosing God to be God. Okay, this this is what it's about. This is the, the stuff in the beginning. Okay, so next God is going to consolidate his people. So we have that very first rapture of the male child. That, that really is sort of next thing on the list. The sign of the dragon, as far as I'm concerned, is the next thing that's going to happen. And then um, Revelation talks about his people um, not as the bride, okay, or as the church. There is no rapture of the church anywhere in scripture. You never see it. There is no rapture of the bride. You never see it. It's not anywhere. There's only the rapture of sons. Okay. Sons, firstborn sons, firstborn sons are the heirs and we are heirs of salvation. We're heirs of Christ. We're going to rule and reign with Christ as co-heirs. We're talking about birthright. We're talking about inheritance. We're talking about elders, okay? Remember the elders of Israel at the time of Moses were the firstborn from the tribes that when the death angel passed over at Passover time, it was to save the life of the firstborn. We're talking about firstborn sons. And um, God is going to consolidate his people, but he doesn't do it like all at once, like every single Christian. It's people... Um, who have actually been faithful to Jesus, okay, are part of the firstborn group. Um, and this is where, you know, when people say that if you're born again, that's good enough to get in. And 
that isn't really what the scriptures teach. The scriptures teach faithfulness, that you need to be born again and you need to be faithful. And if you're faithless, right. well, you can't expect, you know, good things to happen. So the, uh, the, the rapture of the male child is one who's going to rule and reign. And in Revelation chapter 2, in the letter to Thyatira, Jesus says that he is going to uh, allow people to sit with him on his throne and they will uh, rule with him with a rod of iron. Okay, so Christ is going to rule with the rod of iron, and so are his firstborn sons. Okay, and sons are men or women. It, you don't have to be a guy to be a, a son. <laughs> the second rapture is also of sons. It's the 144,000 of Israel. Okay, and they are first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And first fruit, uh, firstborn sons were first fruits. Okay, you had to give your firstborn son belong to God and you had to redeem him, buy him back, right? And in addition to the first two groups of sons who are taken, there's going to be an incalculable number of martyrs. That's Revelation 7. Standing before the throne of God, so many people that can't be counted. And these are the mm -hmm. people I believe that come to faith after that first rapture takes place millions and millions and millions and millions will come to faith. And we know that John can count to 200 million, okay? Because there's 200 million in that army. It's a number bigger than that. Yeah. Incalculable number of martyrs. All right, next, um, next slide. Okay, God is also going to consolidate unsaved people in the shield and you go what the heck why would god do that why would god take regular you know innocent people and have them die well because it's better for you to not be on the earth than to be here when all of those fallen days of noah sons of god watchers demons everything are ruling the earth better for you to die and we know that one third one fourth of the earth is going to be affected by seals one through four peace taken from the earth, people killing one another, uh, famine, price controls, pestilence, death by wild beasts, so on and so forth. We know that one third of the earth will be affected by trumpets one through four. And we know that one third of anybody who happens to survive, anyone who remains is going to be killed at the hour of trial, which is the sixth trumpet, which is the second woe, which is on the same day as the abomination of desolation. So people go, you know, I the way that this is taught is these are all judgments on an unbelieving world. That God is going to pour out 21 different judgments, you know, seals and trumpets and bowls. They're all going to be poured out on people because people are so rotten. It's an unbelieving world. That, I don't think that's the case because Revelation is a book that says that um, this is good news for anybody who reads it. And there's one more consolidation that's going to take place. And we'll just put that on the slide here. If you still got it. Yep. He's going to consolidate the remnant of Israel. At the time of the abomination of desolation, it says the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So God has a place for the remnant of Israel because when the millennium begins, he needs those people to, to be there, to, <laughs> to have the nation of Israel be, re, you know, be the head and not the tail, to be the kingdom. Okay, and he, he's got to have this seed group to start with. So, this is, um, you know, basically what we're looking at as far as the consolidation here. So do you guys want to make some comments here? Hmm. Nope. <laughs> okay. You're doing great. All right. <laughs> good stuff. Okay. All right. So here's just one little piece of information I want to put in, out there and I, I talked about this in my latest video that I did, that I put up yesterday. 
And a lot of people, when they read Revelation, they they think Greek. Okay, they think Western. They think, um, you know, linear, logical, rational. Revelation isn't written like that. It's not linear. It's not logical. It's not chronological, at all. Right. And the key to knowing that is actually in Revelation chapter one, where John says that he is in the spirit on the Lord's day. And we know that there's between five and 800 Old Testament references that are helpful when it comes time to decode what some of this stuff means. So is there any other place in the Bible where somebody talks about being in the spirit? Hmm. Uh, Kip had a question for you. How yeah. can... Well, well, how, well, well, wait a minute. She just asked a question. Do you have an answer um, for the question? No. I'm where else is... Thinking. Where else? Okay. It's in Ezekiel. The Spirit lifted me up. The Spirit did this. The Spirit did that. In, in Ezekiel chapter 1, where we have the wheels within a wheel, uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay, the big wheel is the Maseroth. The wheels in the wheel is the sun and the moon, and they go mm. round. This is... Yep. This is, and the spirit is in the living creatures, and they move. And what we're talking about here, when we talk about the, the Maseroth and the wheel within a wheel, is we're talking about time. Hmm. And we're talking about time travel. Hmm. We're talking about transcending dimensions. Right. And we know that John is going to be on the earth. And then it says, and then the spirit caught me up into heaven. And then the spirit took me into the wilderness and I saw a woman on a beast. And then the spirit took me to a great high mountain and I saw the new Jerusalem coming down. He is a time traveler. He is a trans-dimensional time traveler. So what that tells you right away is that you cannot assume chronology for any of this stuff. No, you're you absolutely can't. right. Uh, Enoch says the same thing in the book of Enoch. And when it comes to my belief, as far as the perspective that God, Christ, and those in heaven look down, it's not a linear format. You know, it's, 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 uh, I think you're on tracking on the right direction. I don't, I don't know if I believe that, but I think it's one of the most fun theories. Have you also heard the one um, when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount that uh, it was a time travel to where, um, uh, where a lot who was it Moses and Elijah to where that was him meeting with them throughout time no, I, think, I, I think she's right I, no I I agree I think that what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration was actually him moving forward in time yeah yeah well, it, Enoch makes it very clear that um, in the heavenly realm time is not linear by any means and all yeah. in, and so many of these NDEs that I've studied have presented that very same thing. Time is uh, much different, and it's almost uh, not even not even a part of their dimension because they can freely move around on the timeline on in this dimension from that dimension. Mm -hmm. So I, I think she makes a very valid point. Oh, I think she makes a valid point. I just personally disagree with it but we don't have to get into why i disagree no, because i love no, the theory and i want to hear more <laughs> so i don't know if you guys see, have seen the movie called vantage point yeah mm -mm. i haven't okay. actually that's really I, good i'm really bad at remembering movies but i do remember from vantage point that what it well the name sort of tells you everything is that there is a uh, an assassination that takes place and um you see what happens during this assassination, there's a bomb that goes off and everything, but you get to see it through the vantage point of multiple different people uh. at different times coming together. So in some ways, this is sort of how Revelation is written. We're seeing um, vantage points. We're seeing things from different vantage points. And it's the same story, but from the perspective of different people. So I'm just sort of throwing that out there. It's kind of for free. But, you know, um, when you get dropped right into Revelation chapter 1, Revelation 2 and 3, you don't really know where you're at. 
it's sort of like when Star Wars came out and we're right there at, what is it? Four, we're at the fourth one. We have no idea right, what happened yeah. before. We have no idea what's happening after. Prequel. We just are there like and that. we have to try to figure it out. Okay. No, I, I think you're, you're onto something. Um, it's, there's a lot of uh, stuff that I've studied that really lines up with what you're saying. Um, it's, that's just my perspective though. Well, I'm excited about it, even <laughs> even if it's just me that thinks it. So, well, um, there's been several, a lot of these NDEs, and what supports this is, in my mind, is so many of these NDEs. They will see people in heaven that are still alive on Earth. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. It, but I've heard this more than once. I've heard it several times. So, it, it, time is is a completely different variable outside of this dimension. Yes, yeah, yeah. Time and space both. You know, if you asked um, Philip when he was, you know, taken up from the Ethiopian eunuch and placed somewhere else, and, you know, Paul says, I was caught up into heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I got no idea. You know? right. <laughs> so there were a lot of, um, even in the New Testament, people who were basic dimen trans-dimensional people. Oh, absolutely. It's, I think it's and, pretty cool. And, and Genesis in the book of Enoch, because they go side by side, Enoch goes back and forth from dealing with God to dealing with the fallen angels and almost like representing the fallen angels as his attorney to God to try to change their mind, yeah. his mind on, on <laughs> yeah, their... It um, <laughs> yeah, it didn't work, but it's... You kind of pick up on that trans dimension yeah. movement between Enoch yeah. and the fallen angels. Yeah. And and one other thing that's not in my um, deal here is is the fact that we see Jesus holding keys. Hmm. Jesus has the keys to death in Hades, which means he has authority. He's going to control who goes into the place of the dead and who comes out of it for the whole end times. And so weird things are going to be happening. Like there's going to be people who wish they could die, but they can't die. Why can't they die? Well, I know who holds the keys and he's not right. letting them die. For a reason. <laughs> right. Okay. And when the beast comes out, rises from the dead, there are people who go, well, Satan can't make people rise from the dead. Well, he doesn't have to because Jesus is going to allow it. He has the keys to death in Hades. Right. He also has the keys of David. Okay. And, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Exactly. It doesn't matter what it is, what dimensional level it is, whatever it is. Jesus is in control. And I think that is one of the most important things about Revelation chapter 1 is the fact that Jesus has the keys. He's in control. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Know, uh, they know the end game. <laughs> yeah. So um, the next slide. Okay. Yep. Oh, wait, if, if you don't I don't know if I'm on the right one here. I got to go back to that okay. one. Yeah, I think it's, is it God will consolidate or the next one? The next one. Yeah, there, there we go. go. So we've got four groups who are going to be removed and brought to a place of what we call relative safety. Okay. Almost every single believer will be in heaven by this point in time. Okay. There's two raptures that will have taken place and millions and millions of Christians will be martyred. Okay, and I don't believe in any kind of weird thing called tribulation saints. A saint is a saint. You're a Christian. You're a Christian. They're going to be resurrected, and um, you know they are. They're not some weird category. That's I get. I get kind of worked up about that one. People go, oh well, you know they're saved, but they're tribulation saints. They're not part of the church. And I go, yes, of course they're part of the church. You can't get into God's presence unless you're a believer, and you know you're part of the church. I'm sorry. Anyway, that's me getting all worked up. Okay, so <laughs> I'll believe. Almost all believers will be in heaven, but not all. Um, the remnant of Israel will be in the wilderness, and most humans will actually be dead. Okay, they'll be dead. And this is to keep everybody in a place of relative safety because what Jesus said about the, the end times, this last three and a half years, is that it's going to be the absolute worst time in all of human history and it's going to surpass i believe the the horrors that were happening on the earth during the days of noah 
Yep. And so the reign of the beast will last for 42 months. This is when the mark of the beast will be instituted. And it's when the image of the beast will be created. And any believers who are left are going to be subject to beheading. And there will be believers who are left. Um, yep. There's two groups of martyrs. The first one is martyrs of the harlot. And the harlot will martyr more people than the beast will. The harlot is drunk with the blood of the saints. The beast just beheads a few people. He just beheads hmm. whatever is left. Okay. So uh, the next um, one. Okay. Let's talk about the day of the Lord. Okay. The day of the Lord is actually, if we were to think about it in terms that we understand better, it would be the millennium. The millennium is the day of the Lord. Okay. This is the when... Jesus is going to rule and reign. Now, the Old Testament tells us that the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And, um, and I think it's in Amos where the, the prophet says, why do you desire the day of the Lord? You know, it's darkness and not light. Well, it's because it's going to come like a thief. It's going to come with destruction. And it's going to last a thousand years. And then at the end of that, there's going to be where the earth is melted with fervent heat and we get a new, a new heaven and a new earth. So the day of the Lord, contrary to what most people teach, is not the tribulation. Okay. Most people say there's a seven year tribulation and this is the day of the Lord. It is not true. Um, the day of the Lord is the millennium. It's the kingdom. It's the great day. It's the, the great and terrible day um, of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, according to Matthew 24, will begin sometime after the abomination of desolation. The day of the uh, and there is going to be a group of people who are raptured before this day begins. And these are those who are alive and remain or survive or are left until the coming of the Lord. That passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 is not a pre-tribulation rapture passage. It talks twice about those who are alive and remain. And that word remain is remnant, the survivors. People who are alive and survive until the coming or the parousia, when Christ comes to rule. Okay. Those who are left until the coming of the Lord will be taken. Okay. Uh, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven in conjunction with the events of the sixth seal. Now, in Matthew 24, when the disciples asked, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And, uh, you know, Jesus says, you know, you know, there's going to be wars and false Christs and this, that, and the other thing. And then he says, and then there'll be the abomination that causes desolation and flee into the wilderness. And, and then he says, and then after the tribulation of those days, the sun will go dark, the moon will turn to blood, and then will appear the sign. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven is going to be right after the events of the sixth seal. The sun going dark, the moon turning to blood. And in Revelation, what we see is God, people on the earth see God and the Lamb in heaven. And, and you know, they go into their hidey holes. The great and terrible day of the Lord has come. Now, the thing about the seals and the trumpets and the bulls is because we're time traveling, we don't know when any of those things are going to take place. We only know the order. We know that seal one will happen before seal two and seal two will happen before seal three. And we know trumpet one will happen before trumpet two and so on and so forth. But that doesn't tell us anything about where they're placed on a timeline. Okay, and so we have to get our indication for where they go on a timeline by looking at other passages of scripture. The day of the Lord will begin unexpectedly like a thief with wrath coming on the beast and the beast kingdom. All right, so uh, the next slide. And when Jesus returns... And he's going to return on a day we know. His actual physical return is going to be, I believe, on the Day of Atonement in some year 
1,260 days after the abomination of desolation. The day of the Lord or the millennium is going to start sometime before that, but Christ's actual touching down on earth is going to happen on a day we know. Okay, And at that time, when Christ returns, all the fallen ones will be cast into the lake of fire, except for Satan who'll be bound into a pit, kept in the pit. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the, <laughs> the happy news here. Okay. <laughs> So, yay, I know, it's such a great story. <laughs> looking forward to that day. <laughs> yeah, I am so looking forward to that day. Uh, you have no idea. Okay, so the next slide. This is uh, who is going to be on earth at the start of the millennium. Okay, who are, there's so many entities, right? You've got all these angelic entities and then you've got people and earth dwellers and you've got Jews and believers and glorified people and earthly people. Okay, let's talk about who's going to be on earth at the start of the millennium. Well, we know Christ is going to be here. He's going to be Lord of all, King of Kings. Okay, he'll be here. We know glorified believers, people who are going to rule with Christ are going to be here. We're going to be ruling with him. We know that the remnant of Israel will be led out of the wilderness. And she will be the foundation group for that new Israel that's gonna come into existence, that, you know, the, the ones who actually believe in Jesus. <laughs> and we know that people from the nations who choose to honor and obey Christ are also going to come into the millennium and they're going to repopulate. They're, these are regular people, they still have sin natures, but they, choose to obey and honor Christ. So the next slide is who will not be here <laughs> at the start of the millennium? Who is not going to be here? Well, Satan will be bound in the pit. Okay. And after the millennium is over, he'll be released a short while. Okay. The fallen angels, all of them, every single last one of them are going to be cast in the lake of fire. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast alive into the lake of fire. The hybrids, the, the earth dwellers, demons, people who took the mark or people who worship the beast and so on, they all go into the lake of fire at that time too. None of them will be here for the millennium. And the next uh, slide is okay, where we finally get to the groups of raptured sons. Okay, the really important thing though is say the judgment of the end times is not on people. Okay, it's on all the fallen ones. The, tr the tribulation so-called is about God consolidating all the fallen ones on earth so that when Jesus returns, he can take and throw them all into the lake of fire. So that when he begins his kingdom, none of them are here. I don't ever hear anybody talking about what happens to those guys and when do they get judged. And the other thing we know is according to what Paul says, he told the Corinthians, he says, do you not know that you will judge the world? Do you not know that you will judge angels? And in Revelation, we read about thrones being set up and those seated on them to whom judgment was given. Okay, this is when we actually will be replacing the old divine council and be the new one, okay? The new sons of God, uh, elders, 24 elders seated in God's presence and, you know, judge the world and judge angels. This is, this is what we're called to, okay? This is, this is our inheritance. It's not just going to some marriage supper of the lamb and sitting and eating steak and, you know, you know, shooting the breeze with your friends and stuff. This is about ruling and reigning with Christ. And it's about having dominion. It's about judging. Okay. We've been called to something that's huge. It's so gigantic. We don't, you know, we don't even stop to think about the magnitude of what we've been called to. Now, when, the, when Revelation talks about people who are raptured, they're grouped according to sons. They're not a bride. No bride is ever raptured. No, no, um, you know, it, it's sons who are raptured, groups of sons. And in Numbers chapter 10, when uh, there were trumpets that were going to be sounded that, you know, according to the signal, who was supposed to do what? 
there was a trumpet sound that was specifically for the elders that when that trumpet sounded they were to be called to moses presence so the male child who's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron when we see him in heaven he's caught up to god and to his throne and there's these 24 elders they're kings and priests we've been made into a kingdom of priests through his blood revelation chapter one kings and priests and then okay but before we leave, we're going to transfer the baton, just like Elijah transferred the ministry to Elisha. We're going to transfer it over now to another group of firstborn elder type sons. These are the 144,000 of Israel. And the last group is the woman's other offspring that we read about in Revelation 12. They're not firstborn. They're the male child has siblings. <laughs> They're not born first. So stuff's a little different with them okay so the next uh slide i don't even know how we're doing on time here i i have no oh idea. you're good yeah we got time and i think i've lost you oh i can hear you can you can you not hear me so are we frozen i don't think so christopher might be Christopher, if you're talking, nobody can hear you. No, we're fine. I'm just listening. Okay. She. Can, yeah. uh, I don't think Brenda can hear me, though. Brenda, can you can not you hear, hear Christopher? Uh, uh -oh. Brenda, Brenda. Uh, she may have lost sound. Brenda, are you there? We can hear you. <laughs> oh, no. E cam. No, it's... I don't think this is an ecam issue. I see her just fine. Yeah, I see her just fine too. I hear her when she's talking. And there's nothing. There's nothing frozen. I can hear her moving around. I wonder if she accidentally muted her sound. Um, let me look here. Um, no, it doesn't say anything that she's muted herself on her end. Hmm. Brenda, can Everybody you hear us? us? <laughs> I don't know if she can see us. Maybe we're frozen on her screen. I mean, she's not frozen on this side. I see her moving around. Hello? Uh, Maybe uh, she's you... calling back. Oh, weird. Yeah, okay. she's. Uh, let me. Switch it out. Yep. Hey there. Hey, yeah. <laughs> that was so weird. Yeah. Your other screen was still going. Yeah, and we you heard you just fine. And, and you called in with your other screen active. Oh, okay. Hmm? You know what? I I could not see. Um, um, so I don't think I can share, share the screen on this one here because everything just froze up on my end. So anyway, I'm like, okay, we'll just... We'll just call. <laughs> we'll oh, just no. Call on this other end. Yeah, you're fine. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Lanny, you have plenty of time. Lanny, thank you for the super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, you're, you're good to go, Brenda. Go ahead. Am I good Do to go? Do you want to switch okay. back to the slide? Uh, can oh, yeah. we on I'll, this? Because sure. I'm on. Um, all right. There we go. All right. So um, there's going to be basically three groups of, of sons who are raptured, okay? The first rapture, the male child, that we see them then as the 24 elders in heaven. They're, they're, this is not necessarily a rescue rapture. This is strategic because the presence of these priest kings in heaven is what's going to allow Christ to move from his role as our high priest at the golden altar to actually taking on his next role, which is the warrior king. He's the one who's in charge of God's battle plan, and he's the one who's going to take the scroll, which is basically his commission. Okay, God is going to hand over this whole how we, you know, end time scenario, how we're going to fight this battle into war. He's handing it over to Christ, but Christ cannot leave um, that 
altar of incense until there's someone there to fill it because Satan hasn't been cast out yet. Okay. So the believers, the 24 elders are authorized to intercede for people on the earth. And that's what we see them doing in Revelation chapter five. And they have the golden bowls of incense in their hand and the prayers are going up. And without the presence of this group of intercessors to sort of fill in the gap there, Christ wouldn't be free to leave his post at the golden altar. Okay, because there would be nobody there to make intercession when Satan accuses. But once believers are there, present at the golden altar, Christ will take the scroll from his father and the events of Revelation will, will begin. And that, that's my basic perspective there. So on the next slide, um, we talk about the next group of sons who are going to be raptured. And this is the second rapture of the 144,000 for uh, sons who overcome. Okay. And my understanding from what I've studied is that the letters to the seven churches are prophetic. They're seven prophetic churches and that the instructions contained in the letters to the seven churches apply to the 144,000 of Israel. And you kind of see it really clearly in a couple of places where it talks about Jews who are say they are Jews but are not but lie, do lie, or Jews who are the synagogue of Satan. We also see in the letter to the Church of Philadelphia that they have writing on their foreheads and we know the 144,000 are going to be sealed and then later on um, in uh, Revelation 14 we see the them having writing on their forehead and there's a lot of parallels between what we read about the 144,000 and what's going on in the letters to the seven churches, which I believe are prophetic. And what it says is that those who overcome will be kept from the hour of trial. And I think um, the hour of trial is one of the most um, specific moments of time in the whole book of Revelation. And my understanding is that time in Revelation is meant to be taken literally. That when um, it talks about 1,260 days, it's 1,260 days. 42 months reign of the beast, 42 months. Three and a half days, the two witnesses lie dead, three and a half days. Five months that the people are tormented, it's five months. If these were, if you could not count on the time factor being what it says it is, then the book of Revelation is not helpful. <laughs> okay? It's supposed to be helpful that people can actually count off. The pe believers who are left can count off when these things are going to happen. Okay, And the hour of trial is a literal hour. We know that the harlot is going to be destroyed on an hour, a single hour on a single day. We know that the sixth trumpet is going to take place on an hour, day, month, and year that's predetermined by God. We know that the hour that the two witnesses ascend, there is an earthquake. Uh, the, the angels that in Revelation 14 who go out over the earth uh, say that the hour of the judgment of Babylon has come. The hour has come. And this is a literal hour. And when you follow this word hour, when you treat it as a moment in time, that the, the second woe, the sixth trumpet, this hour of trial is a literal hour. And in one hour, the harlot will be destroyed. A third of humanity will be killed in a single hour. To me, that says nukes, but it could be something else. Okay, so I've done a video on uh, the hour of trial. Anyway, the, the 144,000 will be kept from the hour of trial. The hour of trial will be on the same day that the woman flees into the wilderness, uh, the abomination of desolation. And if you are part of the, that group of what could be firstborn sons and uh, you don't overcome, well, just like with uh, other firstborn sons that we read about in the Old Testament, you get to forfeit your birthright. So uh, Esau lost his. He didn't, you know, he didn't respect it. He didn't value it. He sold it. Uh, Reuben lost his birthright because he slept with his father's concubine. 
And uh, there's all kinds of examples of people who lose their birthright because they don't live right, okay? <laughs> and it's not like you have to be perfect, but you have to be faithful, okay? And so the 144,000 need to be faithful or they will be left, okay? So in the letter to the church of um, Sardis, boy, scathing, scathing, you know, they, are, they have a reputation of being alive, but they're dead, okay? And then Jesus says, well, there's a few among you that'll walk with me in white, but really, you know, you guys. So there's um, there's reasons why I think the 144,000 are, um, you know, that the letters to the seven churches apply to them. And they're going to be kept from the hour of trial if they overcome. And what, the, what every letter says, uh, if you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, not just to your church, but to all the churches, because it applies to, to all of them. Okay, so we're almost done here. <laughs> almost done, just two slides left. <laughs> so now we have a third rapture, okay? And the third rapture is the one that everybody thinks is the only rapture, okay? And I've talked about this a little bit already. The th Third rapture, according to Matthew 24, is the is for those who endure to the end of the age. Jesus said that it, he who endures to the end will be saved. Okay, and the end of the age is going to happen just prior to the sixth seal stuff. This group are people who are going to have to survive during the reign of the beast. They are the ones that the Paul talks about who are alive and survive or and remain until the coming of the Lord. They're also described as the remnant of her seed or the other offspring of the woman of Revelation 12, 17. In Revelation 14, 14, we see one like a son of man coming on a cloud with a, a sickle in his hand. And an angel comes out from where God is and says, reap for the hour to reap has come. And he swings his sickle in and he harvests the earth. Well, he's not harvesting the earth of dead people, because as soon as you die, if you're a Christian, your spirit goes to be with the Lord. He's harvesting the earth of living believers. He's coming on a cloud, which is what Thessalonians says, that he'll come on a cloud. Okay, And these believers are then the people that you see present in Revelation 15 around the sea of glass just before the bowls of wrath are poured out. So this third rapture is one that does take place on an unknown day. We don't know when this one will take place. It's sometime after the abomination of desolation, but it's going to be before the events of the sixth seal, sign of the sun in heaven. Okay, so, and finally, our last slide. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, I got... Two more. So, sorry. So when we talk about the tribulation, it's a phrase I don't like to use because it isn't strictly scriptural. It isn't. There's all kinds of tribulation. In Revelation, the letter to the church of Smyrna, it says you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful mm -hmm. unto death. I'll give you the crown of life. Okay. There's going to be a literal 10 days of tribulation sometime during the end times because we're not talking history here. We're, we're talking prophecy. This is end time stuff. And um, I forgot my train of thought, but I'll keep moving on anyway. <laughs> okay. So okay. we're, we're uh, the tribulation time. Oh, t about kinds of tribulation. Okay. So we also know that Jezebel, um, this woman who comes in and, you know, says she's a prophetess and, you know, deceives people and gets people to compromise and so on, that she'll be thrown into tr great, her, her children will be thrown into great tribulation, okay? We also know that there's these martyrs who come out of great tribulation, but the great tribulation in Revelation is not the same great tribulation that we read about in Matthew 24, Matthew 24 right. is talking about Jews, okay, those of Israel. And this tribulation is talking about believers. And I believe these are the fifth seal mm -hmm. martyrs who were martyred by the harlot. Okay, so we're, 
The tribulation is not about God's judgment on an unbelieving world. Okay, it's about God separating out those who are not going to be here during the millennium or the day of the Lord from those who are going to be allowed to enter into the kingdom. And God's final judgment on mankind, the, okay, this judgment on mankind, on, on the unbelieving world, is what takes place after the millennium at the great white throne judgment. People are not judged twice. Okay, this doesn't happen twice. It happens once. And the only people who are judged at the end of the tribulation are people who take the mark. And not everybody's going to take the mark. There are people from the nations who are going to go on and live on the millennium, uh, during the millennium. So basically, this time period of the end is the time of the judgment of fallen, fallen angels. Uh, except for Satan, and then I believe death and Hades are the spirits who are over the, those two realms. And Satan and death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire, um, you know, after the millennium. But uh, death will still be in existence during the millennium, so he gets to stay. And of course, the place of the dead, which is what Hades is. I mean, if you got people dying, then their spirit needs to go somewhere. So, um, so yeah, those two guys get to stay. Um, so, last slide. Yay! So now we, we get back to <laughs> the beginning. This is the restoration right. of man's dominion. Okay, Christ is going to rule on the earth with no competition. None. And this is one reason why we know that we're not living in the little while, you know, where um, where Satan is released. Like some people are saying, you know, the millennium has already taken place. No, no, it hasn't. Um, we're not in the little while. If it had taken place, there'd be glorified saints walking around. There'd be people living to be very old. There wouldn't be any demons. There wouldn't be any fallen angels. There wouldn't be uh wars there wouldn't be all the stuff that has been going on or that's happening right at, at this present day and age and the second thing is that the sons of god that is believers are going to rule with christ on the earth that's glorified saints will rule and reign with christ and all the usurpers will be judged or banished okay and that includes the hybrids because it's the hybrids that are going to try to usurp dominion they're going to take over just like they did, you know, before the days of, you know, during the days of Noah, when only one person in his family is left that isn't one of them. Okay. Israel will be the head of the nations. Okay. Jesus will rule from Jerusalem. That's yep. going to be awesome. And people mm -hmm. from the nations will live in peace for a thousand years. It's going to be incredible. And this is how we're going to get dominion back. This is how we get rid of all of the fallen ones. And at the very end of the millennium, of course, Satan is going to be released and he's going to get a bunch of disgruntled people. And again, he can't rule directly. He has to rule through a, a Gog and, you know, Magog. And uh, then there's going to be a bunch of rebels and all of those rebels will then be cast into the lake of fire and um, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire and and God, God only has people God only has people who want to be with him okay that's people right yeah only choose to be with him so it, that's the whole wow. story thank you what a fantastic <laughs> presentation that was a brain bender <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to uh, I'll have to watch it a second time um, to really really uh, take notes because it was a lot of information, but it, yeah. it's great. Yeah. It was very it was very detailed. Thank yes, you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. You're thank welcome. you. Thank you for. You having want to know why I? You want to know why I disagree with you about the time travel? Sure. Let's hear it. I I didn't. I didn't want to mess up your. Just in case you have an aha moment, I didn't want to mess up your presentation and then start like thinking like, does this fit with his logic? So uh, Genesis, Genesis and Revelation are like bookends, right? So in Genesis, uh, in Genesis one fourteen, he says he set the sun, moon, and stars for signs, seasons, days, and years. So God is a God of order. 
He's a mathematically precise creator, and he doesn't change. So when he sets something in motion, it's he knows the beginning from the very end. So he knows the events that are going to take place. He knows the cause and effect of everything. That obviously stands to reason for a creator who's omniscient and omnipotent, right? Who knows everything. Mm -hmm. So he gave us a means to understand time and a means to understand the events that he has set in order and I, as an engineer, I have to hold to what I know uh, to be real because it allows me to separate uh, fantasy from reality. So okay. because of the way my mind works, I can't accept time travel because I haven't experienced it or, or know <laughs> okay. how it fits. So for, for my mind, it, and when, when something seems like it might violate that order that was set in the very beginning, that's an indication to me that this could be figurative. So for instance, like um, if you if you ever watch a movie to where they do a flashback, mm -hmm. um, if you were to read that in writing and it wasn't clear that it was a flashback, you would assume that they were time traveling. But the reality of it is, is they're just giving information of something that happened previously in order to inform what's currently happening now. So that's how I separate those things in my mind. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why I believe, I, I, I don't know if you got to finish my, um, the, my Seven Seals videos, but my understanding of Revelation 4 is it's a celestial clock. It's actually a timepiece that actually informs us when, uh, what the signs are. Uh, I'm very curious mm -hmm. if, uh, if you watch that to, to come back on the show and have a conversation because I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts. Uh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> here's, here's the thing, Watchful. Um, I understand exactly where you're coming from. And I think that applies to the dimension that the Earth people live in. Though yeah. the dimension of the spiritual world operates in a completely different set of rules and laws i think the bible mm -hmm. was written for uh folks that were alive on earth as their guide their you know like the stereo mm -hmm. instructions for life though yep. it's, there, there's so many things that lead to very powerful supernatural things especially the concept of time once you're out of this reality yeah yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and there's definitely supernatural, but just explaining how my mind works and why no, I disagree no, I get with it. something so you, under yeah, so you understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the thing is, is we we could both be right because you guys say that you're, you know, you're the artistic brains where, <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you, you think differently and I'm the logical brain. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, we're all different members, or, you know, we're all members in particular, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, you're you know, absolutely I think right. And it doesn't mean I'm right. Role, it, it, it's it, you know yeah. this is this is how I have to you know study to show myself approved and you know you do what you sure. have to do to study to show yourself yeah. approved. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Cool. No, it's yeah. uh, understanding how watchful's mind work is, is key because a lot of the time people will think that he's uh, disagreeing to be condescending, <laughs> which he's which he's not. He's no. his mind is. Uh, very analytical and things have to line right. up and the key has to yeah. fit in the hole for for his mind to accept it and it took me a right. while to, to understand how he works but it's not because he doesn't want to or dislikes the concept it's just the way his mind works and i think well, over time like he's said, getting he's becoming more imagine, and more flexible so. he's becoming more and more flexible with the idea of supernatural <laughs> stuff I have, yes. Yeah, since since That's Chris cool. and I have reconnected, Chris and I have known each other for about 16 years, and we recently reconnected in the last several years. Uh, oh, previously, wow. I would have... I would have never considered NDEs. I always assumed that those were spiritual possession. Um, life oh, okay. after death, I would have never considered. But, you know, there there are scripture and records to talk about a place of holding, you know, in the Book of Enoch. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. also the spirits that are, you know, cursed to roam the earth. So it's just like, yeah. you know, I need to be more open-minded about these things so that I can understand them. So <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's so, why God paired us together. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Because so there's many things saying there's many things that I had not considered because of the way my mind works that watchful has helped me understand and changed my position on many things because of the way his mind works. 
Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. we really need each other. And that's, um, I remember when I was in youth group a long time ago in Lutheran church there, I, I love my youth pastor. And one of his favorite lines was, we need each other. And I think yeah. that's so true. We need each other. And, you know, we don't have to agree, but we have to love each other and we have to walk in the spirit and we have to exactly. ex right. exercise the fruit of the spirit. And, you know, God is going to make everything clear. We know in part now, someday yes. it's just going to be in full color, depth, revelation, and we'll all know just as we've been known is what the scriptures say. It's it's an exciting yeah. day to look forward to. Amen. So. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank uh, you for that it, presentation. And that was welcome. a really good presentation. I'm impressed that you just threw that together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it was. It was. It was very good. Yeah. Good. Well, let me know what you think about it. You know, if you get a chance to, you know, mull on it for a while, and we will. I did want to sure. ask you, Christopher, a question. Yes, ma'am. Is I I I I don't watch or listen to a lot of near death experiences, but I'm sure you're probably familiar with Nathan, the Jewish boy. Yes. When he was 15, he had a near-death yes. experience. Well, there's some things that I found out or that I was willing to entertain as being uh -huh. possibilities because of, of listening to his near-death experience, huh. especially about right. the two witnesses or about those two men who resurrected yes. there's an earthquake. Yeah. And, and and Jesus coming back then, okay? Yeah. And smelling the people so that they would he would take the ones that he wanted huh. you know that never left my mind and i'm like really i i always heard that you know jesus comes back at the end the mount of olives at the end and it's like you know what i'm gonna, I'm gonna look at that over again and i think he had a, a valid experience at that level. i I, huh. I think that god works in mysterious ways to enlighten us and to give us key nuggets of information yeah. and his yeah. his story from my experience is legit there's always yeah. a bunch of small details that need to line up and they all lined up with him yeah i i thought it was it was really amazing yeah yeah it one of the things though i've found with some of these ndes is these people truly believe their experience and i believe in the spirit they are deceived by the angel of light yeah that's possible yeah totally now I, we we actually had a guest come on the show and he believed what he was saying um but that's a whole nother topic and that's a long-winded yeah. explanation but i do believe there is many ndes that they actually past went into the spirit world think they dealt with christ or god but did not because the enemy is the grand deceiver he he loves to yes. mimic god in everything that he does so mm -hmm. that's just my yeah. position on that yeah okay well thank you so much for coming out all right well yeah. thanks for having me um, and you guys have a great evening i can see we took a long time here oh you're <laughs> fine no it's typical we usually go for about two hours Every day. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, have a good night, Brenda. Thank yep. you, you Shalom. too. Bye bye. Okay. Well, that was fun. Yeah, it, it really was. Uh, I enjoyed having her. Yeah. It, it was it was a lot of information to take in. Um, I her fruit seems really good, and her spirit is very genuine. I don't think I agree with some of the things that she said, but. She really um, seems loving and and um, it would be it would be fun to have her on in a uh, just a round table conversation just to kind of t hit some points and and you know go through scripture and have a conversation on different things. Um, yeah, I would love to start doing that more often in order to kind of like you would do in a study group to where you would like, okay, we're gonna today we're gonna cover you know uh, the twenty four elders or the hundred forty four thousand and just like go around, you know, and say, you know, this is my experience. This is my understanding. This is what I've studied. 
uh, you know, and then just kind of present different things and just have a conversation about those things. I think she'd be really fun with a, in a round table. A lot of her yeah. guests, I think, would be really fun in a round table. And while you guys were talking, I had like four Bibles open, cross referencing <laughs> and checking everything that was being said, just just to see how it fit. So it's um, it, it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that was fun. Do you want to read any scripture, or are you needing to go? Um, yeah, let's get the, let's get this going because we haven't we we keep wanting to do the uh, the commandments here. So let's kick this off. I think we're on um, Exodus twenty one, or um, did we finish yeah. with Exodus eighteen? The people afraid of God's presence. Okay, so switch to my screen here for a second. I want to show something. Okay, doke. Shoot, did I actually close the other window? I think I did. Okay, so if you go into Google and you just type in the 613 commandments, uh -huh. you're going to get a bunch of different results. So you'll get the 613, uh, uh, I can't remember how this is pronounced, mitzvah. Don't well, in this this humble lamb Bible, they have them in order. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get to that. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna get to that. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to explain because this this is a point of this was a point of confusion for me. So when I first started looking at the 613 commandments, I I would get different lists and they were all in different orders, and it was really confusing to me because I'm like, well, if there are the commandments, wouldn't they be in order? So there are different lists put together by different rabbis based on uh, the order that they believe that they should be in. Uh, and then also you have like when you're reading in sections of the Bible, they'll put they'll give titles and headlines um, to their uh, for their groupings for basically the, 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 the context. They're basically contextual. So like what you're reading is contextual. So you're you know, when you read the Ten Commandments and then you, the next subheading and stuff like that. But um, what I personally like, and this is what I think you're alluding to, is going to going through them in order that they appear in the Bible. And this is how I actually like going through it, because then it, you, you know where they start and stop. And all of these ones that are ordered differently, based, they're like grouped and they're categorized, because I think there's, there's like 243 positive ones, and then there's, you know, 350 uh, don'ts, it's like the do's and the don'ts. Um, so they're organized differently but just for our purposes of just like going through them all and seeing them i, I kind of like the like starting where the very first commandment is and then go through like uh four or five of them and then just keep going in a sequential order um was kind of which is kind of what i think you were alluding to but we started um in exodus 20 which is when you put them in order it's like number 25 on the list uh, because, and, and I wanted to start with those because those are the ones that most people are the most familiar with, the Ten Commandments. They start in Exodus 20, which is right after the children of Israel came out of Egypt and Moses went on the mount and got the Ten Commandments from God. So, um, but they're not the first place that the commandments in the uh, Torah start. So, there's nothing in the Bible that says there's 613 commandments. This is just as people have studied the Torah, they've isolated 613 um, places where something where we're told to do something or not do something. And the first okay. one starts in Genesis uh, 128, if you want to go there. Um, I'm in Exodus, so you can... You can read in from the Genesis if you want. I was going to pick up on the the law of the altar on Exodus twenty two, but uh, I'm good with yeah, whatever so that, you want to do. Yeah, and the order of things that puts you in commandment number fifty five. <laughs> good grief! Okay, yeah, I was it just does. read. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I mean, we could we could do it based on categories. Um, but, uh, for the intents of the podcast, I was hoping that we could hit like five of them just in sure. sequential order as they, as they appear in the scripture. Okay. Um, so the first one is really simple. Uh -huh. Um, did you want to, did you want to pull this up or actually I can, what, how about this? I'll, I'll say what the commandment is and you can read it. How about that? So Genesis one twenty eight. All right. 
I have to pull it up in a different Bible. Yep. Genesis. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around with us this evening. I know it's been a, a long show, but we, we definitely wanted to do a little bit of scripture reading. So if you guys don't yep. mind, let's see here. Genesis 128. All right. So God blessed them. Is that what I'm reading? God blessed them and yep. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the sur surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it should be food for you. And to every animal of the earth and every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on earth which has life. And I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Awesome. So that was so that's really appropriate for how we um, with what Brenda shared because she was saying that in the beginning man had dominion, and this is the first time that God gives mankind a command, and His command is be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Huh. So that's that's the first command to to mankind. It's interesting okay. that they they're that the, there's actually a list that breaks these all down. What's the next one? Uh, Genesis 32, 32. Genesis. And this one we should read a little bit of the context on, too. Yeah, I will. So you can start a little earlier, little earlier if you want. Sure. Genesis 32. Let's see. 32, 32. Uh, where should I... What it, should I start with? Um, Is there a heading in your Bible that says the? Because your Bible usually will break it down into like context. Is that wrestling with God? Yeah. Thirty-two, thirty-two. Yeah. Okay. So wrestling with God, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and he crossed over the ford of Jabbok. And he took them, sent them over the brook, and sent them over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of dawn. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of J Jacob's hip and was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. I'm, this is a, I don't think I've read that part before. If I have, it's been a long time, but he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel for you have struggled with God and with men and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked saying, tell me your name, I pray. He said, why is that you ask me my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place. Um, I can't even pronounce that. Is that Panal? I don't know. I'm not looking at it. Okay. Hey, let's just say he called the name of the place Panal. For I have seen God's face. To face. My life is preserved. Just as he crossed over the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. And therefore, to this day, children of Israel do not eat the muscle that is shank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. Huh. Yeah, so that's the second place that there's a command um, that w why they don't eat something, and it's in remembrance of when Jacob was called Israel. That's interesting. Um, so Isn't what's that the what's 
What's the context of what I just read? Can you kind of explain what it was? What that actually was? Was he literally wrestling with him? Well, uh, well, that's you know a lot of what's in the um, uh, the way that Hebrews write is very poetic, uh, very storytelling. Um, so whether it was literal or figurative, uh, I don't know if we really know. But you know, given what we've talked about with angels, how angels are. Uh, you know, when often depicted as human-like, uh, it would not surprise me if this wasn't something literal, if there wasn't a literal wrestling uh, and this didn't literally take place. I mean, I'm reminded of the angels that went into Lot where, you know, they were able to cause blindness on the people at the door. So, you know, you know, if this was an angel wrestling with Jacob, um, you know, being able to touch his hip and cause it to go out, um, this would be something worth, you know, listening to, you know, Jewish teachers on because yeah. um, they can often provide context in regards to like uh, idioms, uh, figures of speech. Uh, and it's so important to understand these things because it gives you so much more information. Uh, a good example is um, uh, recently I heard a rabbi talking about when David took Bathsheba, most people uh, think that he... Um, sinned in taking Bathsheba, and yet so many great things came out of that union. But when you when you understand, uh, you know, that um, her husband was at war, and before they go to war, they actually sign a letter of divorce. Uh, so, and, and also, like, the culture where the king was able to, you know, uh, do certain things. He had certain rights. So it's so important, not to get off on a tangent on that, just using it as an illustration, it's so important... <laughs> Um, to understand um, the idioms and the culture and stuff like that. So this is probably a good place to, to stop on this because I have a feeling we go forever if we keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, it, that's a I really he, good one. I think he may have physically wrestled because it says that he limped. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Hmm. Well, great. That, that was uh, – I, I could read all night, so – um, oh yeah that's great yeah and we'll we'll post a link to this and we'll start tracking what we cover and then maybe we can even do some study on these things in between episodes yeah i mean um i i know you gotta go so i'll i'll, I'll stop but i can mm -hmm. keep on reading but i probably should tend to my children i know my little girl's waiting on me yeah we have right, brother. we have kip tomorrow night um, Ooh. I'm not sure what she's got on deck, but I know it'll be good. So same time, same place, same two witnesses channel. And, um, I think that's it. Remember folks new in the chat, salvation is a free gift available to everybody. doesn't matter what your past history is, what you've done. Christ died for all of us. He just wants a personal relationship with you. It's that simple. I'll leave it at that. Everybody have a wonderful yeah. evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Shalom, shalom. Thank you for watching this segment from our live show. We are live every night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, except for the Sabbath period. See you soon.